Right now I'm working with a coffee place in Kungsgatan in Stockholm, Bacon Street Cafe. My name is Jacob and I'm a founder and CEO of Crowding. I came to see Danny also, see him speak and uh, maybe meet some new people, share some ideas. We are an open innovation crowdsourcing platform for innovations. Pleasure to be here. Have you done this many times before? Just sitting in front of a fire, having a chat. Yeah, it feels really. Yeah, feels good. Yeah, it feels comfortable. Yeah, it's, really, it's good. <laughs> I like it too. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Okay, Danny, uh, tell us a story. Where, where, uh, how did your life start? Where did you grow up? What did your parents do? Uh, it started in Beirut, 76, when the war started. So, uh, yeah. when my mother are really angry at me, she'd say sometimes that the war started because I born you. <laughs> so, no way. so we moved forward to Greece, and from Greece we actually came to what we call uh, Sweden. We call Sweden. Tell, yeah. Yeah. It's a part of Sweden. Was that when 50% you were in Sweden, you know? And but that's Sweden to 50 you. 50% Beirut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah. yeah. That's how it started. That's how it started. It was in December, very cold. And uh, my family left without anything. Mm. And uh, my grandfather actually passed even on the journey to Sweden. Mm. So it was a very turbulent period for my family at that time. So this is the story I have from my mother. So mm. I didn't have any father. Mm. So I grew up with my grandmother and my mother. Yeah. So that's a pretty rough start. Yeah, I can't even imagine how, how they had it actually at that period. Mm. Uh, sometimes you know I complain about my life, you know, but in comparison with what they had, uh, it's nothing probably. How did you survive when you got to Sweden? I mean, everyone will survive in Sweden. Mm. We can go, we can get, go and get, you know, help from the social, you know. Mm. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Have they helped you more times throughout your life? Yes. Sounds like it. Yes. That's why I'm an entrepreneur today. Because yeah. I know if I fail, I can go to them. Yeah. <laughs> So then Sweden must be one of the best countries in the world. Yeah, I mean, you can never <laughs> fail here. You can never you know. fail. <laughs> you will never live in the street. No. As long as you don't drink and take drugs, you will always get help. And Fantastic. You, and you know it, but, but other people might not know it. Do you, do you usually go tell people this just to make them more brave? And but now everyone knows it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we told them the secret. Yes. That sucks. <laughs> Very simple. Take risk. You can never fail in this country. It's the best entrepreneur country in the world. I if, would some, say. if someone here is blogging, write about that. <laughs> you should. You should. Um, all right. And and um, so you came here with your mom and and your grandma. Yeah. Uh, and the, your grandma, she. I mean, if you look at the, her the at the heritage that you that you were born and raised from, your grandma, she didn't have an education. No education at all. She no. could not write. No read. So, uh, I mean, we was not, uh, let's say, the the strongest part of the population in Lebanon, if I say like that. Oh. So, uh, no. Mm. So then, how did this affect you during your childhood? What uh, what happened? I mean, I had lots of love from the home, mm. and uh, they did what they could, you know, to help me, mm. and. Uh, we don't. We didn't have any tradition of studying. Uh, I mean, uh, so it it was a quite early in my life. I felt that you know I need to change that. I had it in my mind. I, I can't answer uh, answer you exactly with how I should do it and with what. But for me, it was a, a kind of dream uh, living inside of me that you know I, I really need to change this. Mm. Somebody need to do that in this family. Mm. Yes. But but a lot in um, I mean a lot of your childhood was really a struggle then 
many senses, right? It was a struggle. When I was 11 years old, I was, you know, um, the social. <laughs> <laughs> they actually took me away because uh, I was a quite, you know, dysfunctional, I would say. Hmm. Uh, I was not uh, doing well in school, couldn't concentrate at all. Hmm. Uh, I started to do some small crimes. I mean, I was just 11 years old. I, I could wake up in the morning. I was not even going to the school. So it was in that level. Uh, and that's really bad. What was your, as an 11-year-old, what was your picture on life? What did you think it would become or it would take you? At that time, I had a kind of self-picture on myself that, you know, I will, I will go the, the bad way. Because my role models at that time, I didn't have any role models. The guys I saw on the street, they was not, I mean, the best role models in the world. Uh, but they was actually a guy who was physically mm. there. So mm. it's better to have someone than no one. Yeah. Uh, that was the case at that time. But it was, a, it was a big change for me when they took me away from the, let's call it the street. Mm. And uh, that helped me a lot. At that time, I was not even speaking even proper Swedish. No. Uh, and uh, so it was good for me to come away. And so school was not important to you at all, but you, you made it through elementary school and you eventually get into high school and you figured uh, like studying was not for you, but you decided to, to go another track, right? Yeah, I jumped off the elementary school. I, I, I choose to go a kind of a practical education, mm. cooking food, you know. Yeah, become your chef. I realized after a while you need still to read there. Mm. <laughs> you still need to do the math, all the boring stuff, you know, mm. that Jeffrey is very good on. Mm. <laughs> CFO. So, so yeah. the CFO, you know. <laughs> so so uh, I, it was too heavy for me, you know, to have this structure in life wake up every morning to have this discipline, to go to the school. I was not ready for that. No. I, was, I think I was uh, too restless to mm. wake up and go and do this stuff. So, so then when but you honestly, it was very boring. But it's, it, it was, was boring. very boring yeah, yeah. to do the school. So what was, what was fun? What did you put your energy and time into then? At that time, uh, it was actually the, the football. Mm. That was the most important part of my life. Mm. Till I realized that I, will, I could not survive on it. That will not pay my bills. Because very early in my life, I, I left home, you know, start to, you know, standing on my own feet, you know. And, and so it was, it was heavy to realize that. And you already told us that you lived off of the social service for a couple of years. But what, what happened to you then that, that made you change? Small circumstances in life, and, and uh, what I believe it's it's very important to take the chance when they're coming. You know, don't think too much and, and listen to your heart and, and really go into it. And uh, I, I get in touch with Free Suicide, which uh, which is a kind of social network. Yeah. And at that time, they need people working for them, so I start to work as a social worker mm. uh, to help other people and and. Uh, and that was the really the first time in my life I felt you know that I could achieve something good, and I even get paid for it. So it was very important for my uh, self-esteem. Exactly. Yeah. Self-confidence. Yeah. Okay, so that made you grow a lot. Who and who were the people that actually believed in you? I would say my biggest role model was uh, Anders Carlberg, who uh, fortunately I passed away you now one years ago. Uh, was he with? He really believed in me and. Yeah. and uh, he showed me that uh, uh, he showed me that uh, how important it is to give other people a chance and take risk, even if you have not uh, proved anything. But give people a, a chance. Uh, if they're willing to take it, let them you know do things that they have never achieved before. Mm. And uh, that was his strength, you know. And he saw that in me, and uh, I grew a lot because of that. And this is kind of uh, actually how your entrepreneurial journey started too, because you were able to gain self-confidence. You started to believe in yourself again. What happened? How did how did your entrepreneurial journey begin for real? Actually, I start to see that you know I have a I have a strength as a sales guy. You know I, I can I can get people with me 
and um, those years I was in Free Susut, I, I, I did uh, good movements there. Mm. So uh, after a while, um, it was actually a circumstance too, but I had a dream that, you know, I want to start my own and, and, and uh, I think I have that in my DNA, you know, to do business. Mm. Uh, but it was very difficult to combine that as a social worker. Mm. You know, uh, it's not, you know, typical to do that. So uh, I was in Lebanon in, on a holiday. And, uh, I saw actually a guy who, who put cotton candy in a tub, you know. Mm. So I get this fantastic idea to start a company when I came home to actually do the same. Weren't there any other cotton candy companies? Actually, I thought I was the only one in the yeah. world. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, the guy was, you know, doing it in a, in a, in a beach, you know. Yeah. So uh, I went home and I called my brother my best friend who was un unemployed at that time you know mm. and i told him i have a great idea we will be very rich trust me <laughs> <laughs> cotton candy yes 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 shit. yeah yeah wow so uh i did my analyze at that time you know it was i think it was alta vista at that time you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i don't even remember yeah, those days at that time <laughs> so um yeah and i read an article about cotton candy in grana lund you know it's an amusement park you know mm. they're selling a lot there yeah <laughs> so, that so was my marketing research I did, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and um, yeah. I had a meeting with the guys, you know, my brother, and, you know, I told them this would be very good. And, and uh, finally, he took a loan, and I had my own savings, and uh, we started a company in a basement, actually. Mm. We started to produce the cotton candy, as they do in the Grönalund, you know. Same way, you very simple. But they it produce it at the actual theme park, and you produce it in a basement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what I was more, you know, I, I industrial in that way, you know? Okay. <laughs> it was... <So> you <laughs> it wanted was to <laughs> industrialize the process. Of, yeah, 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 yeah. It was a production, you know, 70 square meters. You know. So, um, uh, with three rooms inside. So, one was the office, and the production part was like 25 square meters. <laughs> oh, so, so, the landlord was, you know, after... Three weeks, the landlords called me, you know, and say, "What are you doing there, actually?" <laughs> it smells like sugar. Have I not, you know, not explained sure. that already? No, you told me you will sell some sugared product, you know, like candies and some yeah. stuff. But now, you know, the neighbors are calling and they're saying it's smoking everywhere, and <laughs> they see people with white rocks, you know, they look like, you know, are you producing meth or something? I <laughs> mean. <laughs> Okay, how did you respond? It was smelling sugar in all, you know, the building. You know. <laughs> they didn't need sugar even for the sugar cakes. You know. So it after, in, uh, after yeah. three weeks, you know, they canceled me from the contract, which was very good because I realized I can't survive it three years in that, in that <laughs> contract I had, you know, because the orders was coming. It was from big. where? Who ordered this cutting I was a great chain? salesman, I told you that. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's so just I leave start, it there. So I start to call all the customers, you know, in, in, the, in the market, you know, and I realized very fast that my reference was completely wrong. Mm. I didn't understand how big volumes you could do of this. Wow. Yeah, but the volume of yeah. candy is obviously yeah. pretty big. And, and I, 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 you know, I, I was working, of course, very hard, mm. which I still do. And I went in the morning and I, and I had my, you know, fax. <laughs> what? Fax. Oh, fax. Oh, you are too young to oh, that. I don't <laughs> Of course, yeah, I've never fax, seen it for fax, fax, for fax sake. It's something right. physically, you know? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I went in in the morning and I saw this fax coming up, you know, and I read it, you know, and I had an order from a very big client, you know. Yeah. It was like 40 pallets, a full truck <laughs> with cotton candy, one customer. And I start, you know, to count on that, you know, and I was thinking, okay, this is one customer. It was not even the biggest in the market, you know. What could happen with this, you know? And I realized, you know, I have a warehouse in my 70 square meter, which was, you know, I could have like two pallets there. Mm. So you can uh, and imagine you? that my analysis before I started this company was mm. not so sophisticated. <laughs> Very simple. Your Thank office you. was 50 square meters and 25 square meters was the production facility. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the worst of all was when I realized that I couldn't even get in a pallet inside of this door. So <laughs> it was a quite heavy job, you know, to do. Well, luckily, cutting candy is not that heavy, no? No, but still, you need to buy the raw material, which is heavy. That's the sugar, you know. Okay. Yeah. The sugar was really heavy. Yeah. 
Right. But uh, I was happy, you know, because I was always out and selling at that time. So it was my brother who left England. <laughs> <laughs> Does he have any back or knee problems today? Actually, he had. <laughs> he had like a belt around him, you know, when he was producing. Uh, it was amazing times, you know. We learned a lot. Um, and, uh, <laughs> we learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Let's keep going here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one thing you, you one thing led to another, and then you just started Godis Prince and the Ken, the yeah, Kenyan Prince. Yeah, it took like, I mean, to make the story short, the cotton candy. I realized after a while I will not be rich on it, you know. Why not? The market was was huge, no? It was huge, but end of the day, I mean, it's not so funny to eat cotton cotton candy. You do it once a year too. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you can't you can't survive on it, and uh, it was a good lesson for me because sometimes you do something and you go into something and that helps you to see other things you get perspective of other things you get other ideas and you start to build your network you know so mm. and uh, I realized very fast when I call all these customers that I'm in the confectionery industry so okay I was a part of the confectionery industry and I start to look at it and I was a complete new person at that market I didn't know anything about the market so when I visit all, all, the, all the retailers and, and uh, I saw all the big stands that Caramel Kungen had called Candy King, start to think, I mean, who is actually challenging these guys? I was too naive to understand how difficult it was and that was the reason why I started, you know? <laughs> and sometimes it's very good to not see all the threats and all the problems and all the, you know. So I decided very fast to actually challenge them. You really Nobody. have a lot of self-confidence. Yeah. Yeah, a yes, lot. Yes, a lot. Yeah, wow. And I challenged them, you know. Yeah. That was, uh, I realized that nobody had done it during the years, and there was a you know, quite big company. Mm. I felt, you know, if I can get a chunk of that market, mm. good enough for us. So how did you go about to challenge them? What did you do? Because uh, so, you built this company at a very high pace, very high speed. Yeah. In three years, it went from, like, nothing to a lot. In, yeah, in we, your yearly we, revenue and we, we growth a lot, and we was at that time we, we, we have a revenue for over three hundred million. What did you do to get there? Still, I don't know really. To be honest, it was <laughs> like a, it was <laughs> everything went so fast, you know. And and yeah. um, but uh, the thing was that we 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 went into a mature market. Mm. The market was there already, but nobody had challenged it, and nobody believed it was possible to challenge a. A, a company with that uh, market position they had. And so when we start to get one, two, 10, 20 customers, and they see that we was, you know, delivering, and we was actually holding what we promised, and we had a high quality, and we have a very competitive price, and very good logistics, those things in place, and they, they felt that we have an amazing, excellent service level, mm. which was uh, very important for me, because I realized if I, if I would challenge them, the big player in the market, I need you know, to beat them in everything. Mm. So that's what we did. Mm. We actually sell the final product was more or less the same, but we did it in a different way. Mm. So it was more of a service that way than, than a product. Yeah, I mean, we was a, more or less a service provider mm. of, of products that was mixed from different suppliers. Mm. So, uh, so end of the day, we were selling the same product, mm. but the way to the store it was different. Mm. How we actually, um, how we uh, execute. Mm. And how fast did you grow in terms of numbers, employees, and the yearly revenue, first year, second year, third I year? I mean, if we talk about the cotton candy, we did two million first year. That was not bad. Lots of air was selling mm. the market. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we, went, we went from uh, se second year, we went to 10 million. Mm. And actually moved my factory, the small one, to Poland uh, in a small uh, village. And it's still there. And we are right now producing cotton candy, actually. Mm. Believe it or not, <laughs> so it's very, very, very funny that the, the business yeah. is still le uh, left. Actually, are you are you exporting to all of Europe now too, or is it? Yeah, actually, UK and Spain is the biggest market. It's not a huge company. It's like a ten million company. Yeah. But but still, it's it's funny that it's. it's uh, yeah. 
Sorry okay. to interrupt you. Keep keep going. What happened then after the second year? Ten million second year. Ten million second year, and then we started Goody Sprinson, mm -hmm. and uh, we went from ten million to fifty million, quite fast. And we set up our warehouse in uh, outside of Stockholm, and we was you know rigged up for a, for a, um, for a big growth. Mm -hmm. We planned for that, and uh, after that we went to 120 million. And from the 120, we went to 240 million. Mm. And at that time, it was 2008, um, we actually did a merger with our biggest competitor, Candy King. Mm. We had a rolling 12 sales for over 300 million. We had 180 employees at that time. Mm. So we was by far one of the most <coughs> fast growing company, uh, at least in the retail segments. And uh, this whole serial entrepreneur thing, you started your first company at the age of 27, and, and uh, is that part of it? Like, that, you know, why you have such a short, short horizon in that sense is because, uh, you know, you don't have too many years of living, right? Or too yeah. many years of being able to do this. Yeah, I think I can do, like, maybe two, three journeys more, you know. Mm. Uh, I don't know. It's depending on as long you like to do what you're doing yeah. and you feel it's funny. Yeah. I will do this. So it's like you make, in that sense, it's like you make a kid every fourth year and you <laughs> you raise it very well and focus all your time and energy yeah. into that kid. And then you make another kid after four years. Yeah. 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 And cool. divorce from the first kid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move into um, the last part, talking about brilliance and, and despair, and mostly despair, actually. Uh, you've already told us some stories that are really heartbreaking in that sense but if you if you if you leave out the part of your childhood and you look at your entrepreneurial journey what, what was the worst day of your of your life so far during your entrepreneurial journey I have so many <laughs> part that so they were like competing with each other so I don't know which I which one I would choose but tell us about two then. we want me to tell, tell me about two days that were really really hard for you it or was actually um, uh, it was actually with the cotton candy business because that was the business I started, you know. So which is actually the base to what I am today, more or less. So and uh, I didn't, as I told you, I didn't do my analysis, and we took lots of loan and invested in this, and and uh, it sounds like very cheap to invest in a cotton candy production, but it cost us a lot of money. You know. It was like six, seven hundred thousand at that time. It was a huge amount for us. You know. And uh, I started to print lots of jars, you know, and you know they was pre-printed with my fantastic logo, Cotton Fluff. <laughs> it was even a registered trademark. So, and uh, and and um, I started to send samples, you know, to the big clients, you know, and. Uh, and I have a follow-up uh, call to them, you know, and I call them and I say, yeah, have you received my samples? Yeah, yeah, sure. You like my samples? Yeah, it's a really good and nice product. And it's very original, you know, that you're doing it. And do you sell anything else? No, no, I only sell cotton candy. And, you know, they was laugh like laughing. You know. And uh, one of these clients, which was a very big wholesaler in Sweden, I don't need to say any name, but really huge wholesaler, one of the biggest. Uh, I called them and had this follow-up call, you know, and, and I asked them, you know, did you receive the samples? Yes, yes. We have, um, we have two problems, he told me, that you really need to solve, you know. And I said, yeah, no problem, I solve everything. <laughs> First of all, when I received the product, it was full with cotton candy inside. And now it's just a stone in the bottom, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was, you know, mm. completely shocked. Uh, because just like 10 seconds before I was telling him, you know, I can solve everything, but now I was paralyzed, you know. <laughs> solve this, 200,000 tubs, blah, 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 blah. I, I started counting. He was talking, but I was, you know, start to count everything and see, I, I mean, this is a disaster. I am, I am, I'm gone. And, but the worst thing of all, he told me, when, you know, when he knocked me down, he started to knock once again, you know. Like to punish somebody who's already, you know, gone. So he told me, but the worst thing of all, you have completely wrong colors on this. They are not accepted in Sweden. 
So guys, do an analyze at least. Don't put lots of time on it, but do it at least. I didn't. So this means that I had like 200,000 jars that I have, was pre-printed with my fantastic logo on, with the wrong color, with a product that was shrinking very, 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 very fast after three days. I mean, it's better to sell fruit because they have longer shelf life than my cotton candy, which is sugar, you know. So it was like, I had a big problem, as you understand. So that was the worst day in my life, I would tell you, because I didn't know how to explain that to, you know, my friend, my brother, who was producing. <laughs> I'm going to sacrifice his back and his knees for you. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and, and I love the guy who was sitting on the other side of the phone because he told me that, Danny, I like you. If you can solve this, you have a customer. <laughs> and that gave me a kind of strength, you know. Because, you know, he felt that, he felt a little bit sorry about this situation. <laughs> but he was very honest. So... I solved the problem. You, you want to know how? Yeah. If it's not yeah, a yeah, too, no. too long answer, no? No, 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 no. They're enjoying this, man. <laughs> <laughs> I had a meeting with my brother, you know, and, and uh, my, my, my friend, you know, and I told them, guys, we need to solve this. I will, I will print 200,000 labels and you need to put all the labels <laughs> <laughs> on the jars. <laughs> and uh, after that, we need to produce them and we need to you know, foil, mm. foil the, the jar. Uh, and I started searching for machines and so on. And I, I solved the problem. And I received the order from them. And after a while, I. I start to understand that I need to move these factories. I, I, I moved it to Poland at that time. Did you have any people supporting you at that time or were you all by yourself in that sense? I will say at that time I was very alone in those kind of decisions and I was the driving part of everything. The other guys was more following me and believed in what I say. I was like every word I say, yeah, this guy, we believe in him. You know, I have the story and everything. I am a good storyteller, you know? Yeah. You know, I was telling them lots of stories about how good this will be, and you know, they was just following me. And, uh, mm. but they are happy that they did. Mm. Sometimes, you know, they need to put trust on others. Mm. That's good. So what happened to the company then when you, as such a strong leader, left? You mean uh, from Candy King? Yeah, yeah. Candy King is, of course, a much bigger company. I mean, we are more or less 1,000 employees, so. <laughs> It's not falling around me, you know, as a person, I would say. Right. right. Um, can you tell us, okay, I, I think we'll, we like your stories. We, yeah. I think we love them. Yeah, yeah. So I think we can do one more story before we conclude. Um, and <laughs> you have another funny story also about a jar, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, those jars are, you know, <laughs> killing me. They are like, tell I've us. been, have jars around me all my life, you know. Oh, yeah, I had a brilliant, other brilliant idea. I mean, I was, you know, surviving from this completely traumatic things with the jars, with the colors and the things I explained. And like one year later, I have another brilliant idea that I felt that if you take different suppliers, pick and mix products, you know, the ones that you love, where you buy the soccer beta, you know, cola flasker and green frogs and raspberry and licorice skulls, you know, all those things and put them in the jars. You can tell, you can sell um, a jelly classic product to everyone. You know, you don't need to buy it from the, from the shelves, you know, as, 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 as are the traditional way to do that. I had a so brilliant I, and I was so keen to do this. And uh, I start to prepare everything. And if they, at that time it was like 200,000 jars, I did this time it was like 800,000 jars. And the customer were, they were so pleased. At that time, it was more established, you know. Uh, so we had a good connection with, with the big retailers in Sweden. So I was contacting everyone and told them about this great idea. And I, I, and I, I don't joke, you know, it was not even a single 
uh, retailer who was not willing to take the product in. So I have like completely all the market share yeah. for this product. But what it actually did is that, that it sold the health issue, right? With the pizza mix, pick a mix. Is that why it became so popular? I no? felt that I felt that okay, the people who were afraid to go and buy from the from the shelves could buy it in a jar instead and get the ten best favorites, the ten best selling product. We mix them in a jar you know, and do that. You know. So I called the biggest and best suppliers for that. Supplier produce like green frogs, cola bottles, sugar bits. I called them. And I say, we will do this. And they were supporting me. And they even had their brand on my jar, you know. I mean, we're talking about very famous consumer brands here mm -hmm. who was willing to support a Lebanese guy from Kair Holman, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was a, I mean, that was a fantastic uh, thing that I actually done. And as I told you, storytelling is important. Mm -hmm. But it's even more important to deliver. <laughs> Uh, but you did deliver this time. I delivered yeah. a lot. Yeah. I delivered like 600,000 jars. It was amazing. Mm. The problem was <laughs> that three weeks later, I started to get phone calls from the retailers, you know. And uh, they explained the situation like this, that these jars, you know, the products inside, what was the problem with them? And I say, what was the problem? Yeah, you know, the green frogs are white now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that sounds strange. I've never heard about it, you know. Never, never. You know, I didn't have even products in my, on my warehouse anymore because we have sold out, you know. And uh, the salt fish, it was sweating, you know. <laughs> uh-huh, sweating. The liquor skulls, who was so big, was now a micro skulls. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, what? And of course, no analysis, you get this problem. When I saw the business, I was just jump into it. It was so good idea, which it was. Everyone bought it. The problem was that I was buying product from different suppliers. And it was a kind of chemical reaction inside. <laughs> so, <laughs> you should have studied chemistry at yeah. least, right? You would have solved all the problems. So it was like, everything was like a mess inside. It was like a candy soup, you know. So, I have so, I mean, it was so many claims, can't imagine, I was sitting in phone like sweating, you know, getting claims, 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 and paying out money, like, I, I mean, it was what so happened to big your, problem. I, ha I, mean, I, I had like, I had like, I think I had back like 200,000 jars or something. The positive thing, I mean, most of the Swedish people, they're not complaining, they're just eating. <laughs> So I have like 200,000 jars back, you know, so that was... Uh, How did you survive? I mean, you could have gone bra bankrupt, right? I sold them again. <laughs> <laughs> you sold the but problem, I, you sold But them. actually, I explained the problem with them yeah. when I sold them. See, yeah, because you like, what, 200,000 out of 800,000. Yeah, but you have... Uh, were returned, so you could just keep shipping it was, them. It was a huge loss. Yeah. It was a huge loss. Mm. And that was a big problem for me. Mm. So uh, we were actually moving very fast at that time, and we was more established, and we was making money. But uh, this this hit was uh, <laughs> it was not it such was, a good hit. It was no, not, it was, it was really, really heavy for me. I need yeah. even to actually take in more money from yeah. the company, and it was actually at that time I get an investor to the company mm. because of that mistake. What what made that investor believe in you? Since you've made these mistakes twice, like actually, he was the guy I bought mistake. the green frog from, so <laughs> <laughs> he understood Which the chemistry. Which is true, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> he realized that you needed yeah, this knowledge, he, and yeah, yeah, he felt that I could solve a lot of green frogs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was, that a, was that a guy from Småland? No. He is like a small ending, yes, yeah, yeah. but he's from Stockholm. Well, with that being said, <laughs> thank you, and uh, my name is Pyro, I forgot forgot to say that in the, in the start, and uh, please, please come again. In the start, and uh, please, please come again.